Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I can see that a bunch of people are logging on. And uh, we understand that you had an extra step to your login this morning. So apologies for that. And thanks for, um, thanks for adapting so quickly. We made a small change to our registration form and we didn't realize that that would force you to have to re-register. Um, so hopefully we haven't caused any panic. Um, certainly there was a, a little bit of that on our part this morning, but we've sorted it out. Um, my name is Haley. And uh, I'm one of your hosts today, and I, I'd like to say welcome. I work for the Columbia Mountains Institute, or CMI for short, and I'm going to run us through um, some, some introductions. I'm joined here this morning by Juliet Craig and Kendall Banesh with the Kootenai Conservation Program. And um, for those of you who were here last week, you're already aware that we have combined forces. Um, both of our winter webinar webinars have come together into, into one great season for you here, and, and we're really thrilled about that. So thanks for joining us. We have now the CMI CRED Talks, the Columbia Region Ecological Discussions, and KCP's Popular Winter Webinar Series. Um, so what can you expect this season? Um, this season, we're exploring the theme of foundations for resilience understanding departures from historical ecosystems and adapting for resilient futures. We are welcoming seven speakers who will draw on patterns from the past, challenges from the present and scenarios from the future to explore adapting ecosystems for resilience in the Columbia region. Columbia Basin, sorry, I should say. Um, so this year's CRED Talks and the KCP webinar, webinar series is financially supported by the Columbia Basin Trust. Many thanks to the trust for that support and helping us to get this up and off the ground. And today we'll be hearing from Dr. Eric Higgs and Dr. Janine Ramtula, who will introduce, who I'll introduce in more detail in just a moment. Before I do that, however, I'd like to just pause and um, take a, a, a heartfelt moment to acknowledge the land that I broadcast from here today. Um, myself, I'm in Revelstoke, BC, in the unceded homeland of the Sinaiax people. The Shaquapam people have also stewarded this, stewarded this land for a millennia, and the Tanaka call this valley where I live uh, the land of the chickadee in their creation story. And the Okanagan Nation Alliance also expressed strong connections to this place. And what I would like to do now, and those of you who have been participating in these sort of know the drill, is um, I open up an invite for you to introduce yourself, so your name and perhaps who you are working with. And, um, and the territory that you zoom in from today. And this is a great opportunity to test out the chat, make sure you have it open um, and that you can find it because chances are you might be using it a little bit later. Thanks, I see that um, there are some comments in the chats and, and Kendall might be able to respond to a couple of those questions. So as those acknowledgements and introductions are rolling in, what I'm going to do next, tell you a little bit about one of your host organizations. So um, CMI, who is CMI? <laughs> That's what I'm about to talk about. Um, CMI is a nonprofit society and an association for people working in the various fields of ecology. Our home range is Southern British Columbia, Canada, but our membership extends across BC and into Alberta, the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. One of the things that we do is provide professional development opportunities in the form of conferences, courses, and of course, webinars. Um, and we address everything from skill-based research techniques to more complex land management conundrums. And our website, of course, is one of the best places to learn more about what we do or to connect with me. I'm always keen to connect and, and answer questions. Um, but if you were to go to the website, you'd find that there are some really great resources on there. And some of those include proceeding documents and talk recordings from most of our major events. Um, you can find those, of course, at cmiae.org. So at this stage in time, I'd like to pass it over to Juliet Craig with the Kootenai Conservation Program. Over to you, Juliet. Thanks, Haley. Uh, my name is Juliet Craig, and Kendall Banash and I are joining you on behalf of the Kootenai Conservation Program, or KCP. KCP's work occurs in the unceded traditional territories of the Chinaha, Schwabnek, Sinaiq, and Silk Okanagan peoples who have lived here and stewarded this land since time immemorial. We're a broad partnership of 85 land and water conservation and stewardship groups 
indigenous nations, government agencies, resource industries, and agricultural producers working throughout the East and West Kootenays. And our mandate is to coordinate and facilitate conservation efforts on private land and to generate the support and resources needed to maintain this effort, including building technical knowledge in webinars like this. And we're very excited to be hosting this webinar series with CMI and would like to give an additional thanks to our KCP program sponsors, without whom we would not be able to support this type of work. Now, just a couple of housekeeping details. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the event webpage within a week. And we ask that you remain muted and feel free to turn off your camera during the presentation. Please note, we'll be using the chat function for our Q&A and you're welcome to add your questions at any time in the chat, but we won't address questions until the end of the talk. Over to you, Haley. Thanks, Juliet. Okay, so um, now we're about to get into the, the bit that you're all excited and, and truly here for. So I'd like to warmly welcome Dr. Eric Higgs and Dr. Janine Ramtula who may in fact uh, turn our whole theme of resilience on its head, we'll see. Um, they're going to be presenting a talk called Emerging Landscape Novelty. So I have two bios that I'd like to read. Eric is a restoration and historical ecologist at the University of Victoria, Canada. He specializes in philosophy and practice of ecological restoration, historical, ecological, sorry, historical ecology of mountain environments and emerging landscape ecological novelty. He's the author and editor of several books, including Nature by Design, which I read many times in school, <laughs> and Novel Ecosystems. From 2001 to 2003, he was the chair in the Society for Ecological Restoration. Eric directs the long-term research platform, The Mountain Legacy Project, which you can find at mountainlegacy.ca. Okay, so now over to Janine. Janine is an associate professor of landscape ecology in the Department of Forest and Conservation Sciences at the University of British Columbia. She leads the Landscapes and Livelihoods Lab, which examines the long-term drivers and legacies of landscape change with a view to managing landscapes with both a social and ecological lens in an equitable, equitable manner. She has worked in the interdisciplinary projects of four continents in collaboration with local communities, NGOs, and government ministries. And she's currently focused on designing various approaches to forest restoration. So thank you so much for joining us, both of you. I'm gonna pass it on over to you. I'll stop. The Great. Thank you, Haley. Um, such pleasure to be here. I'm um, gonna fire up the presentation here. and just let people know at the outset um, that Janine and I are going to be presenting interchangeably. I'm going to kick it off and then turn it over to her and we'll be going back and forth a little bit. And we have, um, we realized as we were preparing this presentation um, across the Strait of Georgia, um, I'm in Victoria, Janine's in Vancouver. Um, we actually have a lot of material of, so we're gonna be pushing through quite a bit. So. I'm not sure I should apologize in advance, but um, we're happy to take questions later. And if you've got some follow-up, happy to happy to hear that too. Um, now, I'm speaking to you today from the my home in what is now Victoria, which is the traditional and unceded tori territory of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples, the um, which include the Songhees, the Esquimalt and the Wasanich nations. As you'll see, a priority in our work is examining and understanding the colonial bases of the work upon which um, we have built um, this presentation. And um, we're working in creative ways to support the decolonial work of, and of indigenous peoples, including recent collaborations, which this slide um, illustrates with the Stony Nakoda nation um, on a renaming project using some of the historical image collections, but I get a little bit ahead of myself. Um, turn it over to you, Janine, to um, acknowledge. That's great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, and so it's great pleasure to be here today. I'm joining you from the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the uh, Musqueam Nation um, in my office here on UBC Vancouver campus. And I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who introduced themselves in the chat because it's just so lovely to be able to kind of get a sense of 
who's out there in that virtual space. Otherwise, all we see are all these many little boxes. So that's really lovely. Um, maybe you could advance the slide, Eric. So I'm going to kick us off today by talking about the mountain pine beetle. Um, and as many of you will know and will have seen, um, over the last 20 years, there's been an unprecedented outbreak of mountain pine beetle in the forests of British Columbia. Um, I know some of you are from out, out east and probably you've heard about it also. Um, this, this insect is it's native west of the, the Rocky Mountains. And so you can see there's a little range map there and you'll see that it's um, it has uh, until recently um, been been kind of constrained by the barrier of the Rocky Mountains and in, in the north by cold climates. But it's always been part of our forest ecosystems. Its favorite host is mature lodgepole pine. And so the females bury in underneath the inner bark to lay their eggs. And then the maturing larvae disrupt the flow, flows of carbohydrates in the trees and kill the tree. And then the needles turn red. And this is what you end up seeing over the landscape. They stay red for a few years. Um, and so probably if you if you live in British Columbia or if you've seen pictures, you'll have seen these kinds of imagery of these really large, like big, vast swaths of red trees. Um, we've always had periodic outbreaks in the forests out here, um, but the most recent outbreak that we've had is really unprecedented in scale. And so maybe, Eric, you can um, go on to the next slide, which is an animation showing you just how big um, that outbreak has been through time. So it started in 1999, and you'll see we're going to forward here until about 2012, I think. And you can just see in the red the way that the mountain pine beetle just kind of exploded um, across the province. Um, and if you are looking very carefully, you'll start to see some little red patches developing in the northeast and into Alberta. So the mountain pine beetle did manage to breach the Rocky Mountains. Um, and get into uh, the forests, the lodgepole and jack pine forests in the boreal in northern Alberta and in the north northeastern um, British Columbia. And it also, oh, you got to go back one. Yeah, it sure. also pushed, that's okay. It also pushed, pushed much further north than what we've ever seen before. So like that's just a huge, <laughs> huge blotch of red across the province. And in the end, the, the beetle impacted 18 million hectares a forest across BC, and that's of a total, we have a total of about 55 million hectares, so 18 out of 55 is uh, like 40%, not insignificant, um, killing off about 55% of the merchantable pine volume um, in British Columbia. And as I mentioned, it expanded its range uh, first east of the Rocky Mountains, where it hasn't been before, and then also further north. So how did this happen? Um, and probably some of you will be familiar with this story. It, it's partly a story of changing landscapes um, and partly a little bit about suppressing fire. So we've been very good over the last century at suppressing fire in British Columbia. Most of our forests evolved with fire um, and were managed and maintained for a very long time um, using traditional indigenous fire by the First Nations that have lived here for millennia. Um, but we've gotten really good at suppressing it, and so that has created much older and homogeneous pine stands across much of the province. Uh, in other words, a great big banquet for the mountain pine beetle, and then combining that with climate change. So cold winters have often killed off um, beetles. It's been one of the, the big things that's restricted their spread. But as our, as our winters get warmer, the beetles can expand more rapidly and into new ranges. And so kind of an abundance of mature and suitable pine hosts and also successive years of favorable uh, winter and summer weather really allowed that outbreak um, to expand. And really, in the end, what stopped it was just that there was no pine left um, to support the mountain pine beetle um, on the landscape. And so there's a huge amount of dead trees now that are out there. Um, and now we're starting um, to see or to wonder there's been some salvage logging, wondering what the implications might be for renewed fire on this landscape and intense and severe fire um, of the, the like that we haven't seen before. And so we start this start off with this story just to give you a sense of kind of like the, the, the massive amount of change that's starting to happen in a lot of places in our landscapes. Um, Eric and I have been working together uh, for a really long time examining landscape change in the mountains and thinking about what these changes mean um, for management, for restoration, and also for resilience. Um, and so I'm going to hand it back over to him. He's going to talk a little bit about the mountain legacy project. Um, that he and I uh, got started many years ago and that he uh, has now directed for a long time. Um, and some of the imagery that's really inspired the research that we've been doing. And then he's going to segue from that into thinking and talking a little bit about novel ecosystems. So when do changing ecosystems tip over into a new state that kind of require us to think and manage them in a different way? 
And then I'm going to come back a bit and think about, well, if we have novel ecosystems, at what point do those novel ecosystems um, lend us to think about novel landscapes? Are we starting to see landscape novelty that's requiring us to think about managing um, in, a, in a different way as well? All right, Eric, all yours. Thank you, Janine. Well, I'm going to um, dive into the Mountain Legacy Project and speak a little bit about this comprehensive set of um, images that form this massive package of data for us to try to accommodate um, an understanding of the nature of change in mountain landscapes. So many of you will recognize the Athabasca Glacier. I apologize, it's on the other side of the divide in the province of Alberta, not in the Columbia um, Basin, but you get the idea. The nature of images that we're looking at um, tie back to a colonial era survey that took place to create the first topographic maps of what is now Canada. This is a photo composite showing a panoramic view of Jasper National Park. That's actually the town of Jasper in the center and Pyramid Mountain on the upper side from 1915 by the, uh, by the Dominion Land Surveyor, Morrison Bridgeland. Janine and I went back in 1998 and found this in our work. So you'll see a, um, an evidently transformed landscape, a closed canopy, um, lodgepole pine forest uh, really has just spread across the landscape in the 80 years or so since the first images. And then we had the chance to go back again. And this is what we found, a landscape in full color. Just kidding. But we did find, um, you know, one of the aspects of now using uh, color imagery instead of black and white is that you can see really prominently what Janine illustrated earlier, which is this, the arrival of mountain pine beetle as a really significant transformation. So perhaps more on that later, but I want to dive in a little bit to the historic surveying and talk about repeat photography as well. So uh, starting in 1888, Surveyors fanned out over the mountain west as an effort, in an effort to try to create highly detailed topographic maps um, of the landscape for the first time with the interests of resource extraction, settlement, and in some cases, displacement of indigenous peoples. There was a difficult and mixed legacy for sure. And the, the maps that resulted were accurate. Um, important topographic maps, and we were the only country in the world that did topographic mapping systematically in this way. The images they left behind are spectacular, hard to comprehend. So this is J.J. MacArthur's image from the first season of full regular survey photography, 1888. Uh, the town of Banff, which you see in that red square, is just three years old. But let's look at what's inside that red square to get a sense of just how impressive these old images are. So that's what we're seeing. So spectacular detail. And that's what first drew Janine and I to uh, thinking that these images might be useful in terms of understanding the fine scale pattern and process in these mountain landscapes. So we've been returning a lot. Um, so over 20 years, we've been doing field work um, throughout the mountain west, but predominantly along the Continental Divide. And we now have gathered up about 10,000 repeat images um, from hundreds of survey locations that were laid out by those historic surveyors. And just to show you that um, it's not just the mountains that are growing older, but here's a photograph of Janine and me from 1998. So this is our first uh, full season of field work doing repeat photography. You can see that lovely old Linhoff four by five inch film camera and um, the whole scene of the Northern Rockies. I think these photographs are from July. Is that right, Janine? That your memory? Lots of snow. Now, in behind this image collection is a vast and complex um, archival basis. So, roughly 70,000 images are located at the Gatineau Preservation Center that's managed by Library and Archives Canada. Um, and we've been instrumental in helping to um, uh, identify and conserve and daylight these collections.
but it's been a lot of work also figuring out how to move it into the digital era, bring it into um, a, uh, a form that people can use readily. I'll come back to that in a moment. So what we know though about these collections is that they're comprehensive. They cover most of the mountainous regions of what is now Canada. They're systematic. So total, if you take the federal collections and the BC Land Survey, or, survey and some other incidental collections, there's about 120,000 and that's a guess. It's just an estimate. We're not completely sure. There's nothing fast about working with glass plate negatives. All these negatives, photographic negatives are laid down on glass plates. They're also high resolution as I've described before, and we've gone back with a commitment to doing this um, in a research grade way using more or less state-of-the-art equipment. And it gives us an unprecedented view uh, historically of the past. So it takes us way back before, in many cases, before aerial photography. Um, so it's created the largest systematic comprehensive high resolution collection of mountain photographs in the world. And I'm about to show you that there's some big gaps here. And I want you to under, I want to try to make this really clear. Um, this is the website that we uh, serve up. It's open access. Anyone can use it. You can work with the images. We ask that you play nice with them. Um, there are about somewhere around 18,000 images up on this website and about 10,000 repeat images included in that number. So we have a lot of, um, sorry, there, yeah, there's a lot of, no, there's more than that, sorry. There's 10,000 historical and repeat image pairs, and then there's about another 8,000 historical images. Now, if you look at the these dots, um, this is what I mentioned, or that the focus is mostly along the Continental Divide and the areas of the Columbia Basin um, doesn't appear to have images. That's misleading. There are historical images. We just haven't looked at them yet. And uh, it just takes a lot. I, I put up the slide about archival research because it's not a trivial matter to kind of gain access to the images. But if you're in an area of the province of British Columbia that doesn't appear to have any pins on the map, it's not because they don't exist, it's because we haven't got to them yet. So here's an interesting way of talking both about the decolonial nature of the work that we're trying to do, but also the extent of the collections. So this is from a recent article characterizing mountain landscapes in Canada. So on the left side are indigenous territories, um, and on the right side are the linguistic territories um, of indigenous peoples. And what I'm about to do is to overlay the topographic map sheets that were created as a result of the photographic surveyors. So this is what we know um, or where we know images to be. So stay tuned. So you can see that each of those squares, you can see some orange colored squares, which are quite large, corresponding to one to 250 map series, and then much smaller, barely visible green squares, which are one to 50,000. And everywhere there's a square, there are historic images. But it's also really um, compelling just how significant the overlay is with, the, with indigenous territories. And this has become a, a major theme in the work that we do, working with First Nations partners to um, understand the, um, the colonial implication of these surveys, but then also what can be done to support indigenization. All right, just a few examples of what we're doing with these images, and I'm going to shift to talk about novel ecosystems. So this is an example from PhD student Claire Wright, who's working in Waterton Lakes National Park. Each of the dots, the white dots on this map, correspond to a photographic survey station. And on each state, from each station, there are multiple images. So I'm going to take a look at just one, which is from Blackiston Shoulder, one of the highest points of the survey, um, looking east, if you're able to get the reference, um, over the prairies. And that's what it looked like in, historically, this is what it looked like when we first went back in 2004. And then we've gone back to do sequential photography and if you're ready for this, I mean, I'm going to back up once and just take a look. You can look 
at the fine grain vegetation patterns in 1914. And you can see some infilling in 2004 and wait for it. This is 2019. And I know the narrative has been earlier in this presentation talked about mountain pine beetle, but that's not mountain pine beetle. That's the Kino wildfire that uh, from 2017. Now, what we've been doing is developing new tools for being able to visualize these images, classifying them, and then georeferencing them to uh, perform different types of spatial analysis. So Claire Wright uh, used um, a machine learning technology that we've um, developed to apply automated landscape categorization masks. Please ignore the lower right-hand corner. That's an anomaly. Um, <laughs> But that's what that's what the landscape cover looked like in um, 1914. These are the changes in 2004. So the same sequence. And then this is the dramatic impact of that Kenai wildfire. So we've been able to go further than just visualizing these different landscape cover changes um, by using high resolution digital elevation modeling and um, the creation of virtual photographs, so digital photographs that have, <laughs> that are just, uh, uh, they're computed from um, um, uh, an image cloud. So in the upper right, you can see, um, oh, so I'm sorry, I've lost my cursor for the moment. Where is it? Um, you can see a red dot in the image on the upper right, and that's the view shed showing um, the classified mask laying over top of the landscape. So that's in um, uh, that's showing a actual representation of where those vegetation classes are. The lower right shows the classification draped over um, a digital photograph, a virtual photograph. So Claire has started to work on for example, looking at these transitions in space over time. So same sequence, same images as I showed you before, but these are now positioned overhead as opposed to from an oblique view. So that's 2004. And there's the wildfire. So really dramatic changes that have taken place. We've also gone back, another graduate student, James Tricker, has been working in Jasper National Park and he's focused on taking a whole bunch of images that were actually part of Janine's work um, from many years ago um, and create for the first time um, maps, historical maps of vegetation based on the historical photography and then look at how that's changed over time. So that gives you a little bit of a glimpse of some of the work that we're doing right now, trying to um, take the digital images based on the historic glass plates and um, bring new analysis techniques to it. Um, anything you want to add, Janine, before I jump into novel ecosystems? You're good? All right. So let's talk about novel ecosystems and ecological novelty. And this story starts really with ecological restoration. We've, um, a lot of the interests I've had over the years and also Janine has been in how we restore ecosystems. And we've seen a shift um, from what we called in an article we wrote in 2014 um, on the role of history in restoration, a shift from restoration 1.0, which was kind of classical restoration where you had history as a, a template and a singular trajectory and an emphasis on composition to restoration 2.0, which sees things more open-ended. And that um, has been instructional for us to think about a more flexible and open-ended type of restoration. But we're wondering actually if that was enough. And that's part of what this presentation is about. So there's a lot of drivers of change that are shifting landscapes, ecosystems, and the way we approach them. So this is recent work from Persson um, um, and his colleagues um, based on some older works you may have seen related to the drivers of, of change. Um, this is looking at the so-called safe operating space that we have at a planetary scale. So 
everything from climate change to um, biodiversity, um, land system changes, freshwater use, biogeochemical flows, ocean acidification, atmospheric aerosol loading, stratosphere ozone depletion, and the um, arrival of novel entities. So lots of things going on. It's not just climate that's shifting. There's a lot of other things that are driving change. And on top of this, I think, and this is something that is not really captured in diagrams like uh, the one from Pearson et al, or earlier ones from Stefan's work, is that there's also cultural, religious, social, economic, and political change taking place. Shifts in the way we value these ecosystems and what we're willing to both tolerate and encourage. And I think that's a very significant aspect. We're not going to get into that, but I think that larger context is important. What ecologists um, have started to realize a little over a decade ago is that there are ecosystems that seem um, to be non-analog. They don't have any historical reference. We don't have, they've seemed to have arisen in ways that are new in relation to composition and the, and the functions that they have. This one fascinates me. I love this one. It's Mount Sutro in San Francisco. Um, it looks like a sort of coastal, maybe fir forest, but in fact, it's a eucalypt forest. And this eucalypt forest was planted in the 1880s. Um, blue gum trees, Monterey cypress and pine also um, in this landscape. Let's see it where it is in San Francisco. And it has over the years um, become a, both a much loved and a much maligned ecosystem. So it's novel in so many respects. It's one of the few eucalyptus forests in the world that harvests uh, moisture from fog and moves that water down into the soil layer. It, sloughs off its highly flammable bark and leaves and alters soil chemistry. So it's shifting both processes. And of course, it's a very different composition of a forest than, than the coastal scrub ecosystem that it replaced. So there's been sharp contention over what to do with an ecosystem like this. It's been around for more than a century. So lots of people love it. I think it's really beautiful. And there are also people who think that it's a scourge, that it shouldn't be there, it's wrong. That should be coastal scrub ecosystem. And lots of restoration ecologists would find themselves in the latter camp. But the challenge here is that we don't have really good guidance for what to do when we have these kind of dramatic differences. So we've been looking at the concept of novel ecosystems and the implications for restoration. So these ecosystems that are radically altered from historical configurations. Um, might consider their current value and the full range of options available rather than limiting options to traditional conservation or restoration measures. And perhaps restoration in a classic sense is no longer available in some settings, not in all settings, but in some settings like Mount Sutro. So a group of us got together internationally and put together the first compilation of ideas around this in a book called Novel Ecosystems that came out in 2013. And at the core of that was this fairly straightforward notion that really does anchor in conventional thinking about restoration. So if you have um, biotic and abiotic composition of ecosystems along the lower axis and function along the other axis, and you have similarity at that origin point, you start with historical ecosystems which have historical continuity over time, that as you shift in composition and function, you get into this zone that we unimaginatively refer to as hybrid ecosystems, which are ecosystems that have both historical and novel elements. But as an ecosystem changes, like the one I described in Mount Sutro, very significantly, and you think about trying to restore it, is it possible to restore it? And we argue that if it's push past a threshold where restoration is practically impossible, then it becomes a novel ecosystem. 
to the left of that threshold where you have historical and hybrid ecosystems, it's complicated because restoration remains possible, even though sometimes it's quite difficult. An example would be our Gary Oak ecosystems here on Vancouver, Southern Vancouver Island, where um, we have a spectacular array of agronomic grasses, which are very difficult to, to eradicate and fundamentally shape how those meadow ecosystems straight amongst the Gary Oaks function. So this difference between um, novel ecosystems and then their historical and hybrid counterparts is um, kind of rocked um, the restoration world a little bit, trying to think about how we could approach restoration in new ways. This work was picked up more recently in an even broader idea of ecological novelty advanced by Tina Hager and her colleagues in Germany, where they made a really important shift in thinking. They, they said that it's not just about novelty for landscapes, ecosystems, and communities, but it's also about novelty of the organisms themselves. So as we're modifying um, the genome structures of organisms, things like gene drives and um, synthetic organisms, all sorts of other things that are on the horizon right now, we're starting to alter the, the, the organisms themselves as well as the landscapes and ecosystems and communities into which those organisms find themselves. So it's a richer model in the sense that it's looking at both ecological and evolutionary processes. Now that's just a really quick skip through this concept of novel ecosystems. And I think there's a tendency to see this as very threatening to kind of traditional practices and restoration. That was far from its intention. So the takeaway on this is that rather than posing a threat to existing practice, the ecological novelty concept expands options available and provides a more robust and comprehensive toolkit for intervening in rapidly changing landscapes. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Janine. Thanks, Eric. And I hope somebody's going to ask you a little bit about that expanding toolbox and what's in it. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> There's a lot going on in that figure. I'm sorry. Can you just advance the next slide, please? So Eric was talking about novel ecosystems and the kind of unwanted resilience that they that they uh, that they care that they're characterized by that they exhibit. And I think we're starting to see those widely reported around around the world. There was a lot of resistance to that idea when it first came out. But I think um, scientists everywhere are now starting to find examples of that and realizing, yeah, we really are seeing these novel ecosystems and really need to contend with what does that what does that mean and how are we going to manage for that? Um, and so as Eric Herrick described, as we went back in 2019 to Jasper National Park, where a lot of this work got started and we're watching the mountain pine beetle unfold over this landscape, we started to ask ourselves, like, are we starting to see novelty manifesting at the landscape scale? And what exactly does that mean? Is it different from novel ecosystems? And what does it mean for, for restoring? What does it mean for managing? What does it mean for how we think about landscapes um, as a whole? And so landscapes and, and bear with me if you know this already um, landscapes we can think of them as kind of mosaics or patchworks of different ecosystems or, or land cover um, across a large area right so if you take a look at the picture at the top in 1915 um, that was a really a, a patchy mosaic of a lot of early early successional and kind of young forests so some meadows some bush areas a little bit of older mature forest and all kind of patchy all over the place and so if we go back to our mountain pine beetle again that's a good landscape for the mountain pine beetle to have a little snack, uh, but probably not a whole lot more. Um, by 1998, we see a real change in composition. So the composition is kind of like, what are the land covers that are out there and how abundant are they? Um, and then we also classify, we can think about configuration. What's the spatial arrangement of those different land covers across space? And so here um, by 1998, 1998, we see a real change in the composition. So a real um, increase in the amount of mature and closed forest canopy cover across that landscape. And here that's also led to a change in configuration because it's much more homogeneous and kind of spread across the, the landscape as a whole. And um, I noticed that Jen Barron is gonna be giving a talk, I think the next talk talking about changes in fire dynamics through time. I saw her give that talk a few weeks ago and it's, if it's gonna be the same one, it's excellent. So I highly recommend you go um, and hear her talk a little bit about fire and how our fire regimes have changed. Uh, but that's essentially what's happening here. Um, and then in, in landscapes, we have that pattern, composition, and configuration. Those interact with process. So it's the processes that connect 
these different patches across the landscape. So the spread of fire, the spread of animals, the spread of water, the spread of invasive species, those all respond to the pattern that's in a landscape. And so as the pattern changes, the process changes, and then the process itself provides a legacy um, for the future pattern. And so um, what we're really starting to see here is that a change in pattern has allowed a new process, so in this case, the mountain pine beetle, to spread in a way that wasn't possible before, and in some ways to, to set up kind of a new imprint um, if we don't think carefully about how we're going to manage for the future to be able to ingrain that um, furthermore and lead, lead eventually, or perhaps already, to some kind of landscape novelty. Uh, so you can change that slide, Eric. Um, and I think we just popped in, we've just submitted a, a, a paper where we're trying to think a little bit about this, this idea of landscape novelty and what it might characterize with a bunch of examples from different places. And I'll provide a, a couple today, but happy to answer questions about more, more about more landscapes and really curious also for, for all of you that are working in different landscapes about what you think of this concept and whether it might apply to wherever it is that you're working. Uh, next slide, please. So you can see here, this is how we're conceiving of it, that you have some kind of anthropogenic driver of change that creates um, a change in composition or configuration that in turn triggers a change in process. So it's really that interplay between pattern and process and the creation of new spatial dynamics and interactions on the landscape um, that we think eventually might lead to increasing novelty on a landscape. And then there's often positive feedback loops that can establish as well. So if we've got widespread pine, pine beetle mortality. And now we're starting to see in some cases, fire come in with unprecedented severity or intensity that can create other new changes, new novel states across the landscape that we haven't seen before um, that might further cement those legacies and set us up for yet more novelty. Can you change that slide, Eric? I'll give another example. Um, so this is an example that, that actually comes from Northern Alberta um, in the boreal. So it's, um, a landscape, if you look at it, that actually, for, in terms of composition, hasn't changed all that much. It's kind of boreal forest and other places, the boreal that have had a lot of change. But here it kind of looks mostly intact. Uh, but if you squint a little bit, you might see some linear features on that landscape. Um, and um, well, I can't show them to you, so hopefully you can you can see them. They're kind of these long skinny lines and those are those are seismic lines. And so there are they're not very wide, they're usually like five to 10 meters, um, these kind of linear, long linear things that the oil and gas industry puts in um, for exploration. Um, and so they're, they're skinny, but they come back, like they'll be put in every kilometer, or sometimes even closer, 500 meters or so. And so, although it doesn't really um, disturb a large proportion of the landscape, it really changes the configuration because it makes that landscape permeable in a way that it previously hasn't been permeable because it had a kind of an extended closed, kind of a closed series of, of different ecosystem types. Um, and so what's happened here, the story here in, in the large part of the, the Northern Boreal and also in Northeastern British Columbia is that we're starting to see patterns of changes between predator prey relationships. So in this area, um, historically has been home to a lot of the endangered woodland caribou. And those caribou have been hammered by a number of different things, um, but the fragmentation that's occurring here is allowing um, wolves to come in. So the wolves can travel along these linear, um, these linear little highways for them um, much better than they can in, in the, the continuous canopy of the forest. It also creates um, early successional habitat that white-tailed deer like. So deer come in, the wolves come in, they can travel more easily. Uh, they will also follow the white-tailed deer, which is their main prey, but then they will also along the way um, um, kill the caribou as well. And then the increasing populations of white-tailed deer can also create competition um, and moose as well, competition for the caribou. And so we're starting to see a place where you've got a fairly, what would seem a fairly small change in configuration is having a profound change on the predator-prey relationships, the processes, that govern um, the patterns and processes in these landscapes. So if you can give me the next slide, Eric. Yeah, so here we go. The construction of seismic lines for oil and gas exploration creates a pattern change. So enhanced connectivity and new corridors for movement, which provides a shift in the mammal species and composition, and then the process change in terms of those predator prey dynamics leading to increased predation and competition, um, which is threatening the caribou. So it's a type of, maybe you'll give me the next slide, Eric, please. What distinguishes landscape novelty in terms of how we're thinking about it, so it's not so much the extent of change then, but a shift in the interplay between the spatial patterns and spatial processes that shape those landscape dynamics over time. 
And so you can have a landscape that might still look like it's more or less intact, but in fact, the functioning of it is starting to shift in major ways, in ways that really make us think about do we need to manage in a different way. So novelty emerges when anthropogenic drivers cause altered interactions between patterns and processes, producing a shift in landscape dynamics without historical analogs. So in the same way that novel ecosystems are new entities, are we starting to see um, a historical, non-historical um, processes starting to play out spatially over large areas? Um, and then these dynamics are then maintained through reinforcing social and ecological feedbacks. Next slide, Eric. And I think this last section, we're just going to play off each other a little bit. Yeah, and we're I'm just staring at the clock. And um, we'll do this fairly rapidly. I, um, but we want to take just to sort of sum this up, so take some takeaways. And the first one, maybe I'll speak to Janine and then give the next one to you. But so the implications of novel ecosystems is that where we have novel ecosystems, those that are tending towards that threshold that I spoke of, it makes conventional restoration more challenging. So both in setting targets, understanding the nature of historical change and continuity, and being able to actually execute um, what we think of as conventional restoration. Greater ecological novelty may produce ecosystems that are highly resilient in the sense that they're difficult to restore or manage for historical continuity. And there's the rub with the idea of resilience. Restoration ecologists actually struggle with resilience because often what we're doing is we're trying to restore ecosystems that are stuck or highly, I mean, they're highly resilient. And so what, do we, you know, it's, it's difficult to know how to deal with that. All right, this first implication, over to you, Janine. Yeah, and so when we start to think about things at the landscape scale, I would say that a lot of the restoration that we do and, and maybe even a lot of the management that we're doing really happens at the site level. So we're very used to thinking about, okay, we want to restore this particular stand or this particular stream or this particular whatever um, for enhanced functioning or whatever the goal of that restoration is. But I think with this emerging landscape novelty and realizing that the impacts are going over large areas and affecting processes, we really need to start prioritizing landscape scale restoration. And by that, I don't just mean restoring stands right across the landscape. I mean really thinking about the restoration and managing management that we're doing from a spatial perspective. Um, we're already starting to see in some cases that the restoration, the success of restoration in a particular stand is less dependent on what you do in that stand and more dependent on what's going on around that stand that we don't often even think about. Um, so in terms of novel landscapes, we need to start thinking over broader areas and thinking about the connections between what we're doing and the rest of what's going on in the landscape. Um, and so have activities that are more coordinated. Um, and then I would say that for landscapes, we're already starting to see these major shifts in process. We need to think about whether we need to start disrupting those unwanted processes. You know, so mountain pine beetle, if we're going to salvage log all of it, or we've done that in a lot of places, are we just kind of further imprinting you know, that pattern into the landscape that's going to allow those, those processes to continue expanding in ways that maybe, maybe we don't want to see. Um, so we actively need to think about restoring heterogeneity, uh, disrupting processes, or thinking not just about a particular site, but how it's embedded in the greater landscape and, and what we're going to do, how we're going to address those spatial, spatial processes that are occurring around that. Great. And then when Haley invited us to do this talk, um, it was situated within the larger theme of this particular series with the cred talks about resilient futures and my response to Haley was oh, i'm not sure you want us um but you were very kind to take us in to this particular series partly because um i'm not sure we're not sure that the idea of resilient futures is actually the right goal if we're dealing with expanding landscape novelty so Instead of resilience, we think that perhaps adaptive capacity, so that idea of adaptive capacity in ecosystems, which is an aspect of resilience, is maybe a better way of being able to understand how it is that we can think about ecosystems and landscapes that are subject to rapid and significant change. So that's maybe the, the most contentious thing we'll say. Um, and um, I think, I think I'm gonna pause and stop there. Is that okay? I've got, I, I'm realizing Janine um, that I forgot something really 
uh, significant in the slides today. And that was to talk a little bit. I have this final slide that's kind of the walk into the mountains, the indefinite future. Um, but I forgot to mention that we've just recently completed a podcast in collaboration with Future Ecologies, which is a wonderful podcast series out of Vancouver um, on mountain legacies. And um, I'll try to share that link, or maybe I get Haley's help sharing that link. It's a love, I think it's a lovely hour long look at um, the, how we've approached thinking about shifting landscapes and mountain environments. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, everyone. That's great. And I'm just going to say a quick thank you and a quick shout out to all of the graduate students that we've worked with over the last 20 years. Yes. Put so much work uh, into this and then partners as well. Eric, maybe you want to reel them off quickly, but there's been some amazing partners that we've worked with who've really made all of this work possible. Yeah, certainly the long term connection with Library and Archives Canada, with the federal granting agencies, with the Alberta government, um, Parks Canada. There's been so many and we're deeply appreciative of all that support. <laughs> That's really great. Thank you so much, you two. Um, and you can be as controversial as you would like. We're here for a conversation. Um, and uh, and yeah, we're all very interested in, in what you have to say and this reframing of the concept of resilience and you know in what you know in what situations it's a it's a good you know concept and in what situations it is not. Um, I recognize that we are close to our end time of one o'clock. Um, so I just want to say that um, if you have a bit of time, Eric and Janine, we can stay on a little bit later. I recognize mm -hmm. though that we're on the noon hour and lots of people have to uh, sneak off to work and other meetings and that sort of thing. So we might have a bit of an exodus. But at this point in time, I'd like to welcome uh, questions to come forward. Um, our thought is that, as you heard earlier, you can put your questions into the chat and I'm going to relay them to Eric and Janine. If your question is for one of them in particular, feel free to direct that question to Eric or Janine, say, say as much. Otherwise, I'll just um, pose it broadly and they can, of course, figure out who would like to address that question. Um, and before I do that, just thanks again. That was such a beautiful uh, presentation and you bounced off of one another so seamlessly. Um, it was really fantastic, gained a lot. Okay, so we do have one question right away and it's from Karen and um, a, a bit of a broader question, I would say it says, observing the changes in Jasper, is change in landscape cover always bad? Hi, Karen, it's always great to, great to hear your questions. Uh, do you wanna take that, Eric, or do you want me to take it? No, please take it. <laughs> yeah, well, and you can add, and maybe Karen, you'll have a lot to offer on this as well. So of course, change is not always bad. I mean, ecosystems and, Landscapes change all the time and at multiple time scales in response to all sorts of different things. So we expect landscapes to be dynamic and to change, right? I think what we're seeing though is that we're starting to see a level of change that goes beyond what we have seen historically and that in part is driven by anthropogenic drivers and pressures that are new. So that's one thing that I will say. The second thing that I will say is that change, you know, and I've said this for a long time, change change kind of benefits some parts of ecosystems and some critters on the landscapes and disadvantages others. So in large part, whether change is good or bad depends an awful lot on what we as people want out of landscapes. So if you're in Jasper National Park and you're managing um, that park in part for tourism and for a bunch of people to come and visit and all of a sudden your entire park, not your entire park, but a good portion of your park starts to turn red. So that provides kind of an educational opportunity to talk to people about you know, the spread of insects, but it also, creates a huge fire hazard. And so if you're trying to manage for that, then there's real questions about what does that, what does that mean, right? And then questions also about if you get severe fire that comes into a landscape like that and creates kind of imprints and legacies that's gonna continue to affect ecosystem functioning and send those ecosystems off in directions that don't have a historical analog, then maybe that's what we don't want, which is why we intervene and manage, right? So same thing, you know, with fire, we thought for a long time that keeping fire out of landscapes would be good and it caused our landscapes to change fundamentally. And now we look at that change and say, well, there's implications for that change. That's perhaps not what we want. Um, so I don't know if that kind of answers your question and, and probably I would imagine what you think about it, you know, also similarly. So yeah, change is kind of, a, it, it happens in ecosystems and that's natural, but then we've got to kind of wonder what kind of change and how much change and how rapidly that change is happening 
and whether that's in keeping with you know what 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 we have for values of our own in landscapes. That's great, Eric. Anything to add on that one, or can I move on to the next question? So much, but let's move on to the next question. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll get stuck on question number one. <laughs> okay. So there's a question from Dennis here, and he says, interesting slide comparison for Jasper. In your searches of other parts of the continental divide, did you find similar instances of forest regrowth, or were there other comparisons not showing a similar change? Oh, that's a really interesting question. We, um, I, I want to say at the at a very high level that we see a pattern of certain types of change. Um, that's you know, there's local variation, of course, but we're certainly seeing a rise in tree line. Uh, so tree line ecotone is changing. We've, uh, my colleague, Andrew Trant at the University of Waterloo did a study that showed that using our image collections along the spine of the Rockies. Um, happy to share that article out. Um, we're also seeing just lots of forest infill, which is a subject of Janine's um, research in Jasper from before. Um, we're seeing the effects of indirect effects of the suppression of indigenous land management across the board, for sure. And I just got a PowerPoint presentation. I don't think he's with us today in this Zoom, but from Rick Arthur, who I've done lots of work with over the years. He worked with Alberta Agriculture and Forestry for many years as a fire specialist. But he's just been looking at 1926 aerial photos and comparing change in the front ranges. And he's seeing a very significant increase in in forest cover in that area. And that's sort of what we expect in a sense in the absence of, of um, you know, a lot of it prescribed fire and the, in the absence of large scale wildfire, um, that's what we seem to be getting. So Janine, do you? Nope, that, that's great. And I, yeah, and I would just agree that I think we, we do see the same patterns over over and over again. And I think looking at some of the talks that are coming up over the next few sessions, I think you're going to get those same stories again and again in different ecosystems. So yeah, lots of info, lots of, you yeah. didn't talk about glaciers, but loss of glaciers. we got lots of glaciers oh, right. where the glaciers are just like disappearing very rapidly, tree line changing. Yeah. I mean, I do, um, I do love the complexity of ecosystems. There's mixed severity um, forests that we're increasingly recognizing have tremendous variation. And in mountain environments, you can get significant changes just within a few dozen meters, you know, from one from a south aspect to a north aspect, where you get big shifts in how vegetation responds just because of that particular, you know, the direction in which those mountain slopes face. So there's a lot of fantastic variation. So um, there's also that level of variation that sort of, you know, is, uh, you know, shaping these systems. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Okay, so another question here from Sandra. Um, were forestry practices in replanting mainly pine and clear cuts a big part of the pine beetle devastation? That's a you question. That's a me question. Okay, yeah. So I, I would say that no, like what we're really seeing is just kind of like um, 80 years or 60 years of more fire suppression. And so stands stands that would have been a lot younger kind of when the fire fire suppression I think started to get pretty successful in the 1940s and so um, it's basically since being since that time that we start to see a lot of the younger stands basically that are just aging through time there's a really neat paper if you're interested send me an email by Alan Carroll that tracks kind of like you can take a look at an age a stand age distribution of the, the pine stands across British Columbia and so it used to be like 50 or 60 years ago that about 25 percent of our pine was like in the right kind of mature age age stand for what the mountain pine beetle prefers but now it's closer it was closer to about 55 I think uh, percent of the of the, the pine and that's basically just that those stands have been aging over the last whatever it is 60 or 70 years and so usually those older stands you would get fire that would come in and it would kind of keep a, a mix of different stand ages across the landscape and that's just not what we're seeing. Um, and, and so now like basically if we if we have all of these stands in the mountain pine beetle if they all you know they the pine stands die and they all start to regenerate and we don't think about what we can do to, to break up to provide more heterogeneity there then we may be setting ourselves up in another 60 or 80 years for another mountain pine beetle outbreak like the one that we have now. 
So that's what I mean about creating kind of a, a legacy on that landscape. Or if we start to get fire that goes through and that fire, because of all of the fuels that are there can be a lot higher, higher severity, higher intensity than what we have historically seen in these areas. And that, for example, can start to have impacts on the soils. And so then maybe we won't get regeneration the same way. You know, it's not it's not exactly clear what, what's going to happen, but just that you can start start to see like those those legacies and those imprints, that pattern that's going to influence future process and kind of a cyclical nature. Yeah, I was. Um, I mean, my thinking was profoundly shaped by the aftermath of the Kenai wildfire in Waterton, which, um, you know, I don't know how many know the story of that fire, but it it went it was a slow simmering fire for um, a couple of weeks and then started to move and Parks Canada evacuated the town of Waterton and the park itself. And the fire came up over the Continental Divide and within just a few hours burnt um, almost 40% of the park area and a lot of it at very high severity. And it was sobering to walk through that landscape. I mean, I've been taught by, you know, people working, you know, fire and forestry um, that I should be celebrating the chance for resurgence and rejuvenation in these ecosystems. But the response was highly variable. I mean, there's some fantastic regrowth going on in certain areas, but I climbed an area that I knew quite well um, with Kim Pearson in Waterton, you know, staff member at Waterton Lakes. And there was um, a section that had burned right down to mineral soil. So it's almost like sort of a Pleistocene reset, you know, and with all sorts of, you know, novel pathogens and invasive plant species and so on. It's, it's unclear the combination of those drivers with this very profound fire effect, what trajectory that particular ecosystem is going to be on. So not the whole park, but just that, you know, just really thinking about the profound, you know, nature of the change that's occurring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. So our next question, I think relates back to a question that we discussed briefly early on around what are the implications of landscape novelty for restoring ecosystems in BC and so Marlene has a comment here and she says, the smelter impacted around trail is an example of a hybrid ecosystem impacted by metals um, and sulfur dioxide, mm -hmm. I think that is, that has impacted the landscape composition, function and process, uh, and process change, I think. With disclimax, disclimax ecosystems with high invasive species components resulting, uh, restoring these ecosystems is challenging, especially with accelerated climate change, pushing the system further away from expectation. Um, any suggestions for how to address restoration in such an impacted landscape? Ooh. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you want me to start? That's your toolbox. Let's hear it. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, right. Um, so I've driven through trail lots and have some sense of the changes on the landscape. I would never want to. I haven't worked in that particular region, so I don't want to make any detailed um, recommendations or prescriptions. I just don't know the system well enough. But I, I certainly understand that the smelter impacts and the, the legacy of mining has had pretty significant changes. And I wouldn't be surprised to, you know, to know that a lot of the, um, the aquatic and terrestrial features have been impacted, both directly and indirectly, over the years. So. I think, um, I mean, the response in areas like that will be um, potentially to accelerate um, the impacts of other kinds of drivers like um, aridity, like warming, uh, changes in precipitation and so on. So you get these sort of intersecting changes. So the response to restoration, I think, needs to be a more open-ended one. And I'm sorry to be so general, but I just wish I knew that system a little better stop my car instead of driving through. But, you know, being able to um, do what I think restoration can do very well, which is to set clear goals for what it is that you're hoping to achieve. So those goals are aspirational and they can be around recovering uh, certain vegetation communities. They can be about um, wildlife species. They can be about human engagement too. But you set those clear goals and within each of those goals you set, um, objectives that are measurable in one way or another, however you want to measure them, so that you know whether you're actually getting to where you think you want to be. And then 
one of the great aspects of, I think, good restoration is being able to adapt, right? Adapt, you know, go through that cycle and kind of reevaluate like, oh, wait, we tried to do this, didn't work so well. What do we do now? Or it worked really well, in fact, almost too well. What do we do? And I think that's the essence of what we find in a lot of restoration projects. Sometimes it's a lot more formal, sometimes it's less formal. Um, I'm doing some projects on Galliano Island right now, as, as is Janine on at the Millard Learning Center. And there's this fascinating, um, you know, cyclical re-asking of what our goals are and um, being able to have a, an open-mindedness to what it's going to look like in the future. That's where I think a lot of restoration is going. So less on that idea of like very fixed targets, you know, that reference native ecosystem that's been promoted with classical restoration. Does that help? Marlene, do you want to say anything to Janine about that? Yeah, yeah, it kind of helps. That's, that's kind of the approach being taken because there is a recognition that we're not going to get back to what it looked like before. So we have to be pragmatic and set realistic yeah. goals and monitor and track over time. That yeah, is basically perfect. It. Yeah, thank you. Oh no, that's great. And thank you very much for that. Thanks, Marlene. Um, okay, so we are, we're at 10 after one. I'm going to suggest that we maybe do one more question. I apologize sincerely to folks whose question hasn't been asked, but I, I do see that we've lost just over half of the people who were attending and, and folks are likely needing to go. Um, so I'm going to jump down to Peter's question. He's got the next one. And he says, given that historical photographs for the Mountain Legacy Project occurred after railway construction and associated spike and the associated spike in fires and clearing. How do you think that influences your perspective of historical landscape composition? You want to take that, Eric? Well, why don't you take it because I blabbed on. Yeah. <laughs> All right, sure. Uh, you can correct anything I say. So yeah, Peter, I think you're absolutely right. Like, I don't remember the year. There was a big fire year, 1889, and then another one, I think 19, was it 1905? 10. Um, 1910, thank you. And these photographs were taken in 1915. And so certainly what we're seeing at the landscape there is a, a period of time after um, there had been um, more fire that's that had gone through the ecosystems. Um, that said, we do have a lot of, um, you know, when we take dendrochrono dendrochronology studies, so when they go in and they pull tree cores and they take a look at the fire history that we can extract from looking at, you know, patterns of, of burns that come out of those tree cores. Um, that we do see a history in Jasper National Park and lots of other places that show a long-term history of a lot of both low severity and then mixed intensity severity fires that have gone through these ecosystems um, for as far back as we can kind of pull those, those tree cores, right? So the last two, three, four hundred years, um, signals dying away a little bit longer in time. And so, so yeah, in some senses you can look at it and just say, yeah, those pictures are showing a period of time that had, like big fires had just gone through. Um, but on the other hand, the ecosystems really had been before that also shaped over long periods of time with fire. So we have multiple lines of evidence um, that suggest that maybe we're seeing kind of one end of, you know, after, um, you know, after a period of time where there had been more widespread fire. Um, but I also do think like those fires were really, were really patchy and it was a period of time that had a lot more meadows and a lot more shrublands. We can see that also in soil profiles. Take a look at a lot of the forests that are there now. When you look at the soils underneath them, they actually show that historically those areas would have been more in meadow, um, in meadows and the kinds of soils that are under grassland. Um, so yeah, as I was saying before, ecosystems are always dynamic and they always change. So anytime we take a snapshot in time, it's going to be particular, you know, to the recent history in that area. But I do think we have multiple lines of evidence suggesting that that's much more similar to what those ecosystems would have looked like. In, in the hundreds of years preceding that than, than the landscapes that we're seeing today. Right. And, you know, we can see with, in some of the early um, uh, efforts in partnership with Stony Nakoda Nation, we've been looking at some of the historic photographs in relation to um, oral histories around uh, traditional land use. And we're seeing aspects of what the, um, what those traditional land uses would reflect the signatures that they would have on the landscape. So really fascinating um, thing about that. So I think, I mean, I sort of got rid of the word baseline out of my vocabulary as a result of looking at these images, because I think many people would say, oh, look at the historical image. 
that's now our baseline, that's our reference. Whereas in fact, it's simply an argument. It's like a visual argument saying, ha, huh, this is what the landscape looked like under quite different conditions. And this is one line of evidence that we can use to help shape what we're doing in the present as we think about the future. Yeah. And yeah. can I just, Haley, may I just fit in one comment? I wanted to go back to the question that Marlene had and make the really um, obvious observation, Marlene, if you're listening still, that um, the work on novel ecosystem and novel landscapes is intended very much to support the kind of work that you're trying to do, which is to say, if you're in an environment where you've got conditions that are just very different, and I see I, there's so many things happening in the chat, I'm not very good at following things, but I saw a comment about nitrogen deposition, which is a really big um, potential driver of change as well. You got those kind of things happening, then, you know, having a more flexible toolkit, if you will, think about restoration is a good thing. Yeah, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna go back to another thing you said too, Eric, about goal setting, right? Like it's really ultimately like change is gonna happen, and it's really about you know goal setting and what is it that we want to see. So where are we losing ecosystem characteristics that are important and valuable to us that we want to be able to manage for? Um, you know, and what is it? What is it? And that doesn't just mean that you know anything that we desire we should make happen, but really having those conversations about what are our goals here. And then, as Eric said, the adaptive, the adaptive bit also as we as we move to do restoration, and what works and what doesn't, and constantly reevaluating is really important. Yeah, I I I, used, I, I joke that um, you know the future is not about conservation by ecology, but about conversation ecology, because I think we're going to have to navigate so many complex value laden issues around what it is that we think are appropriate goals in these ecosystems and landscapes. So, you know, I think that's really speaks to a lot of the work that's being done by people who are participating today across BC and across the Columbia Basin. So thanks very much for giving us a chance. It's great to see so many people and um, people from the past and people I've met. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for such a beautiful presentation and just that seamless bouncing between you. It, it was fantastic. It's nice to have both of your minds and perspectives. And um, I know that there are fewer people here, but I, I have been receiving emails and you've seen and, you know, it's been a very active chat. People are really appreciative um, that you've taken the time to share this work with us. And I think you've posed some really interesting questions and, and gotten people really thinking. Um, apologies to folks whose questions we didn't get to. There were some really great questions that would have stimulated some more conversation, um, but we'll have to postpone those for another date. If you do feel like your burning question hasn't been answered, feel free to send it to me and I'll forward it on to Eric and Janine. And of course, they're very busy um, and you know how emails are, um, but they will do their best to get back to you. Um, so at this point in time, I just, of course, wanted to extend a thank you to our speakers uh, and also our funders and our partners. Um, so a thank you to the Columbia Basin Trust, a thank you to KCP and all of your core funders. Um, we couldn't do this without you. And a plug for next week. So Janine already did this for me. I almost don't need to, but we're going to have Jen Barron from the University of British Columbia join us next week, same time, same day. Um, Janine's been, or sorry, uh, Jen's been in the background helping me to put this series together. Um, so she is owed a thanks in that regard. And, um, and I've heard part of this talk before. It's excellent. She's expanded it um, for us and to sort of dovetail well with the other presentations that we're anticipating in the series. Um, you'll need to register and uh, get in touch with me if you have any questions. CMIAE.org is how you can get us. Um, have a really great day, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>